Good evening. My name is Andrew Murtha, and I'm the George and Sadie Hyman Professor of China Studies and the Director of the SAIS China Global Research Center at Johns Hopkins SAIS. We are honored, indeed humbled, uh, by the magnitude of tonight's program. Truly world-changing events are often only recognized as such only in retrospect, as they recede in the rearview mirror of time. This is especially true in today's world, one of superlatives and fickle, rapidly moving 24-hour news cycles. This was not the case with President Richard Nixon's February 1972 visit to China. What is clear from watching the newsreels, reading the memoirs, the oral histories, and declassified documents surrounding the 1972 summit is that it was recognized at the time as being exactly what it was, a truly historical event with profound global significance. This self-awareness alone made the stakes impossibly high, and they were made even more so by the secrecy and planning, the imperatives in establishing trust where none had existed for a generation, and overcoming the deep differences in ideological and political outlooks that threatened to scuttle the initiative at any number of key moments between 1971 and 1972. History is important here. One of China's sources of strength is in its long history. One of the strengths of the United States is in its refusal to be beholden to its own history. Yet in today's climate of Sino-US relations, the overarching questions plaguing our bilateral relationship, that is, were we wrong? Were we naive in pursuing engagement with China? These questions betray a fundamental lack of understanding of what the world looked like 50 years ago and ignore the incalculable benefits that have accrued to both sides. When seen in this context, the alternative to Nixon's initiative would have been unthinkable. And yet, Rapprochement with China was anything but inevitable. It required an outsized vision, a faith in the existence of an un unobservable fount of trust, and an ability to, in a Maoist turn of phrase, move mountains politically to seal the deal. And whether we know it or not, whether we choose to believe it or not, we are all beneficiaries of it. Has it been smooth sailing since then? not by a long shot, but it was anything but smooth sailing even back in 1972. And the actors involved approached their craft with eyes wide open. They knew the history of US-China relations has always been one of misunderstandings, disagreements, unmet expectations, and a steady stream of disappointments on both sides. But these were never meant to be the point even as they have dominated the narrative, particularly after the 1989 crackdown in China and the fall of communism throughout Eastern Europe and eventually the Soviet Union. No, the logic of the relationship was far deeper and more profound. An understanding that an engaged China was not simply a desirable effect for global stability, it was essential to it. And while geopolitics was a key part of the equation, so was the notion articulated by Nixon in his seminal 1967 Foreign Affairs article, quote, we simply cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations. They are to nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. There is no place on this small planet for a billion of its potentially most able people to live in angry isolation. If our long range aim is to pull China back into the family of nations, we must avoid the impression that the great powers or the European powers are ganging up. The response should clearly be one of active defense rather than potential offense and must be untainted with any suspicion of racism. And that brings us to tonight's program. A few housekeeping notes. Ambassador Stapleton Roy is unable to attend because of a scheduling conflict. The run of show will therefore proceed as follows. Our two speakers, Ambassador Winston Lord and Ambassador Chaz Freeman, will deliver their comments, each for up to 30 minutes. They will be followed by a moderated discussion led by Susan Thornton and myself before we move into the Q&A portion of the program. Please send us your questions as soon as you have formulated them using the Zoom Q&A function, and we will get to, them as, uh, to as many of them as we can. 
This is a long program because we anticipate many questions and look forward to a deep conversation as befits the commemoration of this truly historic event, the efforts that led to it and the transformation of the world that set it in motion. Finally, I would like to thank all the people besides tonight's speakers uh, and uh, moderators who have worked tirelessly to make tonight's program a reality. Although there are too many people to thank by name, I do wish a shout out to Ellie Rostum, Amanda Nepomuceno, Hosta Coleman, Dr. Carla Freeman, Chris Crosby, Gabrielle Hendy, Danielle Kahn, Chris Pina, Jessica Moreno, Pedro Matias, and Mo Alahi. I will now pass the microphone over to my colleague, Dean James Steinberg, who will introduce tonight's speakers. The Honorable James B. Steinberg is the 10th Dean of Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Prior to becoming the Dean of SICE, Dean Steinberg served as University Professor of Social Sciences, International Affairs, and Law at Syracuse University and served as the Dean of the Maxwell School from July 2011 until June 2016. He previously served as Deputy Secretary of State, serving as the Principal Deputy to Secretary Clinton from 2005 to 2008. I'm sorry, and from 2005 to 2008, he was Dean of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Pol Affairs uh, at University of Texas in Austin. Uh, from 2001 to 2005, Dean Steinberg was Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. He has served as Deputy National Security Advisor to President Clinton from 1996 to 2000. During that period, he also served as the President's personal representative to the 1998 and 1999 G8 summits. Prior to becoming Deputy National Security Advisor, Mr. Steinberg served as Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff and as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Analysis Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Drawing from his scholarship and public service, he is the recipient of the Joseph J. Kruzel Memorial Award, the American Political Science Association, the CIA Director's Medal in 2011, and the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, also in 2011. Mr. Steinberg received his BA from Harvard and a JD from the Yale Law School. Jim, I pass the microphone over to you. Thanks, Andy, and thanks to all the people at the Global Research Center and, and my colleagues at Johns Hopkins for pulling together this really extraordinary event on this very extraordinary occasion. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here and have a chance to listen to the discussion that we're going to hear this evening. And who better to, to have this discussion with than our three um, participants tonight, two of whom were present at the creation of this great event 50 years ago, and the third of whom has played a major role in stewarding US-China relations in more recent years. Um, they're great friends and great colleagues, and, and I'm so pleased to welcome them. Uh, first, we have uh, Ambassador Wynne Lord, uh, who, as you know, uh, played a critical role in helping uh, the president and uh, uh, Mr. Kissinger uh, organize this extraordinary event. Um, he uh, was, uh, has played an incredible role throughout the history of US-China relations uh, really for an extended period of time. And I had uh, my own privilege during my days as um, the head of the policy planning staff to have uh, Wynn's face staring down at me every day, reminding me of the, the high standard that I needed to uh, hold myself up to. As you know, he served as our ambassador to China from 1985 to 1989 and um, served as the assistant secretary for East Asian Pacific Affairs beginning in 1993 when we served together um, in the Clinton administration. He's also served as the chairman of the National Endowment of Democracy, vice chairman of the International Rescue Committee, and chairman of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's National Commission on America in the New World. Um, when, uh, as I say, has uh, also played a critical role in out of government, uh, he was president of the Council of Foreign Relations and, and played a leadership role in helping the American people understand and discuss the, the issues of our time and has received enormous uh, awards and accolades for his, uh, his career, including the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award and the Defense Department's Outstanding Performance Award. He's the author of Kissinger on Kissinger, Reflections on Diplomacy, Grand Strategy and Leadership, which came out just a couple of years ago. Uh, when a graduated magna cum laude from Yale and then an MA from Fletcher, um, 
and has received honorary degrees from Williams, Tufts, the Dominican College, and uh, Bryant College. Uh, our second uh, member of the, the great team that, that made this all possible is Ambassador Chaz Friedman, who is now a visiting scholar at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs and the chairman of Projects International, Inc. He began his career uh, in nearby in India, uh, and, but he specialized uh, throughout his career in Chinese affairs, uh, as well as the Middle East. And uh, uh, Ambassador Friedman served as the principal American interpreter uh, for President Nixon's visit uh, to Beijing. In addition to his uh, service in the Middle East, in, the, in East Asia, which included being DCM in Bangkok and Beijing in the 1980s, uh, he uh, was also our ambassador to Saudi Arabia. It really shows the versatility and range that he's brought uh, throughout his career. Uh, he began with a certificate in Latin American studies from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and has certificates from both the national, in the national and Taiwan dialects of Chinese from the former Foreign Service Institute Field School in, in Taiwan. He also uh, got his uh, BA from uh, Yale and a JD from uh, Harvard Law School. And finally, uh, Susan Thornton, Assistant Secretary Susan Thornton, who is currently a senior fellow uh, at the Paul Tsai China Center at uh, Yale Law School, and who served uh, uh, before that as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Um, she's had almost 30 years of experience in dealing with um, uh, U.S.-China relations uh, and has played a critical role uh, in U.S. policy, uh, ranging from dealing with bilateral relations to regional problems such as crises dealing with North, Amer with North Korea, uh, trade in the uh, East Asia, and the fast-changing international environment. Um, she received her master's, happily, I'm pleased to say, from Johns Hopkins Sice, and we're so proud uh, to count her as one of our alumni, as well as a bachelor's degree from uh, Bowdoin, majoring in economics and Russian. So an extraordinary panel at an extraordinary time, because uh, it's all, uh, as we think about contemporary events, not only in terms of the bilateral relationship between US and China, but also the complicated questions involving the United States, Russia, and China today in connection with the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, what better opportunity to hear from people who understand what the original goals and intentions of the opening to China were, as well as someone who's been so involved in the evolution of US-China policy uh, over the last several decades. So with that, Susan, let me turn it over to you. We're all uh, excited and looking forward to the conversation tonight. Great. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, I think first we're turning it over to Ambassador Win Lord for his um, kind of reflections, reminiscences, and comments on this incredible and momentous occasion, the 50th anniversary of Nixon's visit. And of course, um, Winston Lord is famous for not being in a seminal photograph of uh, the meeting between Chairman Mao and uh, certainly President Nixon, but he got the photograph later. So I hope um, when you can tell us about that and, and the rest of your impressions and uh, memories from that event. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Susan, and Andrew and the team that put this event together. I'm pleased that we have up to 30 minutes because this is a long journey and it goes back to 1962. And Mr. Zluck, the GS-15 in the State Department, he was obligated to interview my wife to see whether we could get married. I had met Betty at a place called the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, which some of your audience has heard of. And I dated her because she took very good notes in economics class. But I went then to get married with her in 1962. And since she was a Chinese citizen, I had to get permission from the State Department. Mr. Zluck was assigned this task. We went over to the State Department. He sat us down and uh, said, I want you to know that if I don't approve this marriage, uh, you can go right to the White House. And that, that won't make any difference. You can't get married putting us all at ease. He then asked me to leave. And then he began questioning my wife for an hour and a half. First question was, who is Vardis Fisher? And some more questions. How do you make a death in the afternoon cocktail? 
then named the 13 original colonies in the order in which they joined the Union. And finally, named the starting offensive line of the Green Bay Packers. Now, of course, Betty had no trouble with any of these questions, although I think she got wrong the left guard for the Packers. But in any event, this look ended up with the final question. So this is the key question. I said, what are you going to do, uh, Ms. Bao, uh, if I tell you that if you're, you get married, your husband can never work on Chinese affairs? And she turned to him and said, look, he can find other countries to work on. He can't find another girl like me. So we got married and I got my revenge on Mrs. Luck because nine years later, although I had not taken Chinese, I thought I would never work on China. So I never learned the language, sadly. But nine years later, uh, I was the first American official into China after 22 years of mutual hostility and estrangement. Now, in order to get to the summit, and to understand it, we have to understand the development of it and the context. But first, let me ask my host, am I coming across all right? Because my screen is, is blank. Is it all right? Looks fine. Can you hear everything all right? Yep, got everything. Looks good. OK, fine. I'll go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Let's remember the landscape in 1969. Uh, we had tremendous domestic turmoil, Vietnam War assassinations, resigning president race riots. We had an uneasy relationship with the other nuclear superpower. We had no contact with one fifth of the world's people. We were bogged down in a long war. As Nixon and Kissinger came into office, they both saw the need to open up a new relationship with China. As Andrew pointed out, Nixon had written about this in Foreign Affairs, and he saw this as a factor for global stability. Kissinger's independent assessment was more based on balance of power and having an impact on the Soviet Union and other countries, but they both shared both perspectives. And on February 1st, 1969, one week after his inauguration, Nixon a memo to get Nixon in touch with the Chinese. And soon after there were the border clashes between China and Russia further gaining our attention and I must say, gaining the Chinese leaders' attention as well. So what were the goals of each side to move toward each other? Let me frame this from the very beginning. On the US side, we wanted to have uh, communication with one fifth of the world's people. We wanted to have not just Moscow be the spokesperson for the communist bloc. We wanted greater stability in Asia. We wanted to have an impact on Moscow and have better relations with the Soviet Union. We wanted help on the Vietnam War. Uh, we wanted to lift the morale of the American people, knowing that if we opened up with one fifth of the world's people, that would put in context the inevitable ambiguous withdrawal that was coming from a corner of Southeast Asia in Vietnam. And we wanted to show the world we could act boldly on the world stage. The two main objectives for the Chinese side were to balance the polar bear to the north, which was threatening them, they had the border clash, the Soviets had invaded Czechoslovakia, the Brezhnev Doctrine. <clears throat> and the other goal was to break out of their diplomatic isolation. They were still in the Cultural Revolution, had only one ambassador abroad. These are the goals of the two sides. Spoiler alert, both sides achieved the great bulk of these objectives. It was in the Chinese parlance turned out to be a win-win uh, situation. Now we had two challenges to get going with the Chinese, one public and one private. We had to send public signals to begin to condition various audiences, our own, China itself, our friends around the world, that we were moving in a different direction. And so we took some unilateral steps to relax economic restrictions, steps the Chinese didn't have to reciprocate but would note. Uh, and we put language in speeches and reports indicating a new direction. The other challenge was to get in touch with the Chinese. We had no communication, of course, after 22 years. We finally settled on a mutual friend, Pakistan, as an intermediary and began sending notes between Kissinger and Joe and Lai through the Pakistan ambassador 
in Washington, Henry and I would greet him and we would get the Chinese note and we would send notes back ourselves trying to see whether we could set up a, a visit. Uh, we finally uh, managed to negotiate the parameters. The main objective from our side was making sure that the Chinese were willing to talk about something besides Taiwan or the agenda. We were clear we wouldn't go unless we had this broader uh, agenda. And so we finally ended up with settling a July 71 secret trip uh, to Pakistan by Kissinger. And I know in the question period why we probably have to be kept secret and so on, uh, in order to see whether a presidential visit was possible. Uh, so there were two objectives in this trip. One was that, uh, and the other was to draft a communique that would announce uh, the forthcoming event. Now, this was part of a secret journey from Pakistan to China. Uh, we now have on the screen uh, the first night of the secret trip, which I'll get to. But the, uh, there was a cover trip to Southeast Asia. We went to four countries, uh, and then we went to Pakistan and snuck off secretly. I had a particular challenge on that plane, which was quite small, it was not Air Force Two, which was taken up, because I was in charge of briefing books and we had three different versions. There was one version for myself, John Hodge, Dick Smyser, and Kissinger, the four Americans going into China. There was another version for a few people on the trip who knew we were going to China, but didn't even know the details of the China stop. And then there were many on the plane who didn't even know we were going to China. So I was not only updating in the briefing books, but I had to update three different versions. And of course, Kissinger, who was never satisfied, would wake me up just as I was going to sleep and make me redo the whole thing. So that was quite a challenge. <laughs> Another aspect was that the cover story for Kissinger in Pakistan was that he had a stomach ache. Well, unfortunately, on the way to, to Pakistan in India, he got a real stomach ache, which he had to cover up because we wanted to preserve our cover story. Finally, we were still offering the Soviets a summit first. They had been dragging their feet. They, of course, didn't know we were going to China. We gave them one last chance while we were traveling. And then Al Haig, Kissinger's deputy, called me in India in code language that I think a fifth grader could have figured out. But he basically said the Soviets have once again said they don't want a summit. Uh, little did they know they could have had a summit first before the Chinese, but they lost the chance. So we got on this plane from Pakistan secretly. As we got onto the plane, there were four Chinese there greeting us, several of whom were in this picture that you see on your screen sat down by Joe and I to give us a, a warm welcome. The Secret Service was so surprised by this that they went for their pistols, but they put them away. Uh, we took off, and I must say, of all the events in my career, the, perhaps the most dramatic was this one. Uh, here we were flying at dawn by K2, the second highest mountain in the world, snow-capped, about to unleash a geopolitical earthquake. The James Bond secrecy of it, the fact we're going to meet these Chinese leaders, and for me, the fact that my wife had been born in Shanghai many years before returning to the land of her birth. It was also dramatic for Kissinger, of course, who was getting ready and talking to the Chinese, getting ready to meet Zhou Enlai. But his main preoccupation was the fact that his staff assistant had forgotten to pack any shirts. And so he uh, was going crazy. He thought he was going to look ridiculous in China with no good shirts. John Holdridge, who was six foot three, lent him his shirt, which Henry wore, and he went around looking like a penguin. I, of course, told Henry that he hadn't even started to sit down with the Chinese to negotiate yet, and he'd already lost his shirt. And the shirt had a label in it which said, Made in Taiwan. So anyway, that was uh, quite an eventful journey we Landed in a secluded airport in Beijing, greeted by a long march uh, general named Moshe Ye, the future foreign minister Huang Hua, went to the uh, guest house and engaged in, 40 in uh, 49 hours of discussions with Joe and I and his lieutenants. Uh, in the midst of this, the Chinese gave us a private tour of the Forbidden City. They walled it off from everybody else because this was secret. <clears throat> I was lugging around a special CIA 
briefcase with three different locks on it with our classified material. But I didn't mind, it was quite a dramatic experience. And then we went to have <clears throat> a Peking duck lunch with Joe and I. And what was interesting about that was his discussion of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, he, of course, was locked up in his own office and suffered. The revolution was still going on, although the worst was over. And to show his cleverness, he indicated all the depredations and the losses suffered during the revolution, the fact he had suffered. But then he went on to say, however, I did not have the vision of Chairman Mao, who looked far into the future and saw that our society was becoming like the Soviets. We were getting bureaucratic. We needed more revolutionary fervor to shake up our young people. So we needed some chaos. So what was Joe doing? Indicating to us that the revolution was a disaster, sending the transcript to Mao showing that he saw how far-sighted uh, he was. Uh, this is typical of Joe's uh, uh, cleverness. In any event, in those 49 hours, we established the fact there was enough common ground to go ahead with a presidential visit, and we negotiated a very short communique. The drama of the event meant you didn't have to explain it at great length, <clears throat> but these were quite tense negotiations because the Chinese wanted to make it look like that Nixon was eager to come to China. They were gracious enough to welcome him. And we wanted to make it look like uh, the Chinese were eager to have Nixon, and he was gracious enough to accept. So we met halfway, uh, and then we went back to Pakistan and we went uh, to Paris. And interestingly enough, in Paris, we had a secret negotiations with Le Duc Tho and the North Vietnamese, where naively we thought we had made another breakthrough. So Henry and I, on our way back to the States, <laughs> thought maybe we had a double header here, not only the opening of China, but real progress on the Vietnam negotiations. Uh, the latter clearly uh, was uh, premature. So you had the San Clemente announcement on July 15 about the trip. Let me pause here to say that that announcement, I believe is the hinge of the entire foreign policy of Nixon while he was in office. Remember the landscape I sketched. Here's what happened within 15 months as a result of that, and I'm dating it to the announcement because Within days of the announcement in San Clemente, the Russians rushed in and asked for their own summit. We made immediate progress in the Berlin negotiations and arms control negotiations. So we proceeded uh, to have a summit in February 72 in China, a summit in Moscow in May 1972 in Russia, a breakthrough in the Vietnam negotiations in October 72, and a signing of the peace accord in January 73. I was very fortunate to be involved in all these initiatives, and I must say I was uh, quite busy as well. Uh, in addition to all what I've sketched, again, keeping in mind the original objectives, it showed we could act dramatically on the world stage. It lifted the morale of the American people. It turned out to be popular. It put Kissinger on the map for the first time, and it helped Nixon get reelected. So I think all of those emanated from the July 15, 71 announcement, which of course was then fleshed out by the presidential visit. Now that brings me to the October 71 trip, which we went back publicly this time with White House staff. They were designed to set up communications, the itinerary, Mrs. Nixon's itinerary, uh, sightseeing, uh, security, media arrangements, and so on. We were there to further the agenda for the president and the Chinese leaders, and to begin drafting a communique. You never leave this to the last minute, particularly when you've been enemies for 22 years. Uh, now, before I get to the communique, what was interesting about how the Chinese handled this public visit, which by the way, took place within weeks after the Lin Biao incident, which we can get into, uh, we saw a lot of security. This is a, one of the Chinese leaders who tried to oppose the initiative and crashed in an airplane. Uh, we didn't know about it uh, at the time. But the Chinese, of course, just like the American side, had to get their public condition to what was happening after 22 years. So they very skillfully did this in stages. We had the very private meetings with Joe and Lai. We then would go to a terrible uh, ballet, 
exposed to some cadre or more leaders. Uh, we then went to the summer palace where the president was going to go exposing us to Chinese tourists and ordinary citizens. So they were carefully staging public exposure and conditioning uh, the public. But the most interesting thing that happened on that trip was the drafting of the Shanghai communique. With about three days to go, Kissinger gave Joe and I a draft communique for the president's trip. It was not naive, we recognized we were enemies, but it did accentuate, as these tend to do, the positive uh, in our coming together. The next day, Joe and I came in, having checked with Mao, I'm sure, and almost literally threw it on the floor in contempt. He said, this kind of traditional communique makes no sense. We fought in Korea, we've been enemies for 22 years. Uh, let's do a different type of communique. Let's each side state its differences, both in ideology and philosophy and on specific issues. This will look credible, therefore, to the world when we have some agreements, because we've been honest. It would reassure our respective allies and friends that we weren't selling them out, and it would condition our confused publics. Now, Henry and I were rather taken aback, partly because this was so unorthodox, and partly because we had two days before we were leaving. Henry asked me to redraft it, and I stayed up to 4 a.m. He then woke me up and took it on from there, and we negotiated for another 48 hours and got most of it done, except the most difficult issue, of course, which was the Taiwan, Taiwan issue. Uh, so we went back having that for established pretty well how the trip would go, which brings me uh, to the trip itself. And you're now seeing the photograph uh, that uh, was previewed uh, by my colleagues. This is the famous Nixon Mao meeting all the photographs that were issued, and I'll get back to this, but end by just to the right of Henry Kissinger, cutting me and uh, Miles' grandniece uh, out of, of the trip. Uh, but let me get back to that in a minute. In getting ready for this trip, I've never seen a president, and I've dealt with six or seven, I've been to many summits and high level meetings, I've never seen a president who works so hard to get ready for a trip. I was in charge of the briefing books, of course, assembling it from all the government agencies. There were six, if you stacked them at each other, they'd be a foot high. I know he read every page because every page almost was marked up with underlining or questioning. And even as we flew to China via Guam and Hawaii, he kept sending questions back to us in the back of Air Force, Air Force One. So it was uh, an extraordinary uh, preparation. Uh, we landed, rather Spartan reception. The Chinese kept it under control. We thought it would be a more colorful one, but they rightly saw that it was premature to do that. Nixon instructed all of us to stay on the plane while he could get off alone and stride forward and shake Joe and Lai's hand, which is a great symbol for the Chinese because in the 1950s, then Secretary of State John Foster Dulles refused to shake Joe and Lai's hand. Uh, so that happened. And after only one hour in the guest house, John and I came back and said that Chairman Mao wanted to see Dr. Kissinger and Mr. Nixon. He wanted to see Mr. Nixon above all, of course. And Nixon, of course, asked uh, Kissinger to go with him. To my everlasting gratitude, uh, Henry asked me to go along, both because of my role and up to then, and also that he knew I was a good note taker and he could focus uh, on the meeting itself. I'll get to the substance. We go more into questions and answers, but uh, to explain this picture, at the end of the meeting, Nixon turned to Joe and Lai and said, Mr. Lloyd was never at this meeting, cut him out of the communique and all photographs. Uh, and it was for good reason, although my ego was hurt, uh, because the Secretary of State was not there, which was already humiliating. But to have a third person, to have a, a young punk uh, involved as well, was just too much. And so for many years, the only person outside of this group who knew I was there uh, was my wife, Betty, for whom I never kept any secrets. Which reminds me, in terms of keeping secrets, I meant to mention this earlier, but when I took off on the secret trip, remember now there was a public covering, Henry told me, said, look, I know you share everything with Betty, but you cannot tell her about this trip because if it leaks, it's gonna be blamed on you because she's Chinese. 
I said, Henry, I won't tell her, I promise. Of course, I had every intention of telling her because I kept nothing from her. So how did I square this circle? Well, I'm a punster, and in those days, Beijing was known as Peking. So as I was packing for the trip, I called Betty over to the window of our house and looked out and said, look, I think I see a Peking Tom. That's all I said. She's pretty smart. She got it. I could tell Henry I never told her, but my wife knew what was going on. In fact, I called my mother law just before I left, and I almost fell off my chair when she said, I hope you enjoy your Peking duck. Now, how she had the antenna to pick that up, uh, I'll never know. Back to the Nixon Mao meeting, uh, I'm happy to say a year later on a return trip with Kissinger, uh, we were meeting with Joe and Lai, and uh, suddenly he said, the chairman wants to see Dr. Kissinger and Mr. Lord. Now, Chairman Mao wouldn't know me from Lady Gaga, but what the Chinese were doing very skillfully was the making sure I could go to the meeting with Kissinger, because everyone in the American side outranked me, George Bush, Francis Cochra, uh, this is the only way, if you'd only take one person, so I got to go to it, and Joe and I then gave me the photo you're now looking at to prove, indeed, I had been at the meeting. On the substance of the meeting, we were puzzled at first when it was over. It lasted an hour. Joe and I was already frail then. He talked in brush strokes. He didn't want to get into great substance, despite Nixon's efforts, kept deflecting that to Prime Minister Joe and I. Uh, and so we were used to the elegant phrasing of Joe and Lai and therefore were somewhat puzzled and even disappointed. But we recognized over the coming days as we had a big agenda with Joe and Lai and others that Mao had skillfully and randomly, supposedly, had hit the key points in a sentence or two of each of their policies, that they could wait on Taiwan, that they were about the Soviets, that Mao had some opposition, even that Kissinger uh, had a reputation with women and so on. Uh, and so he had set up the framework and the structure for Joe and Lai. It was like an overture uh, to a symphony. And the agenda itself, I'll save that if you want to get into it, uh, but I have already indicated, he was indicating by having this meeting at the very beginning of our visit that he was putting his stamp of approval on it. So even though he had some of us sort of like an emperor without warning, we were delighted because usually he would wait to the end of a trip. He was demonstrating to his public and the world that he approved of this initiative. So we had several days of negotiations and then we finished after tough negotiations, the Shanghai uh, communique. Uh, the genius of that communique is that we agreed to put off intractable problems above all Taiwan so we could get on with areas of common interest. Uh, and on the Taiwan side, uh, I believe both sides obviously had to make some gestures. We put forward an ambiguous one China policy, which met the Chinese needs, but it's been held up today with, by, as a standard of a policy, and for 50 years, not everyone's been able to figure it out, which is the genius of it. Ambiguity comes in, comes in handy. And what people forget are the tremendous concessions that China had to make. For years, they'd said they wouldn't even talk to us unless we solved or at least made progress in the Taiwan problem. But here, with this communique, we maintain diplomatic relations with Taiwan, we maintain our defense treaty, we maintain troops in Taiwan, we maintain arms sales. Uh, so keep in mind that both sides had to move, and I would argue that the Chinese actually had to move further, but I'm not saying we didn't have to make a gesture as well. But on the last day or two, just before the communique came out, we were in Hangzhou, and for the first time, and this is, of course, disgraceful, the Secretary of State and Marshall Green, his top China advisor, saw the communique. And of course, if you haven't been in a negotiation, you always feel you can do better. But they had a lot of concerns. They perhaps exaggerated how much trouble Nixon was going to get in, but he was nervous. And I was sitting with Henry in the guest house, and Nixon comes into the room and says, oh, we got to reopen the negotiations on the communique with the Chinese. Now, Henry, of course, was a guest. 
What do you have? If I go back to you, oh, we first communicated for several months. Uh, I know the product bureau has approved it. The chairman's approved it in Beijing. And we're issuing it in two days. And here we are in Hangzhou. And now we got to start over again. So Joe was graceful. He understood the domestic needs of Nixon. However, he wasn't going to budge on any key issues. And the issues with this embarrassing reopening really fell into three categories. <clears throat> One were some, a couple of fundamental changes on Taiwan, which was no way we could even ask for, let alone Gates. So Henry put them aside. <clears throat> there was a whole series of technical issues that modestly improved our position in various parts of the communique. And Joe agreed to those and saved some face. And then there was one very excellent suggestion by Marshall Green. <clears throat> our draft had us reaffirming all our alliances, uh, but leaving out Taiwan. And of course, in the 50s, Dean Rusk had done the same, leaving out Korea. Well, 1948, and maybe it wasn't Rusk, but in any event, our Secretary of State had left Korea out of perimeters. So Green had a great point. So what we did was we cut out any mention of the alliances. We showed our friendship in other parts of the communique uh, so that Taiwan wouldn't stick out. But Henry, after alerting Joe Lai in advance, when he talked about the communique in Shanghai on its issuance, reaffirmed the American Defense Security Treaty with Taiwan uh, on Chinese soil. Uh, you may want to put up a couple more pictures here. Uh, this is the first meeting between Nixon and Joe and Lai. Uh, and we had several like that on the American side. It's John Holdridge at the far, me in the near with the sideburns. Uh, and then the other pictures with me, with Mao, and with Joe, which you know, she can put up. Uh, in any event, so we issued the communique and started flying home. And what was interesting on the flight back when Air Force One was that Nixon and Kissinger were still nervous about the reception that this summit would get in the United States. We had been unaware of the fact that television pictures, the first really highly televised summit in history, had been beamed back to American audiences who were watching at their breakfast or dinner tables, Joe and Lai and Nixon toasting each other, uh, the Army PLA band playing Turkey in the Straw and You Are My Sunshine, uh, Panda Bears, Mrs. Nixon at the zoo and so on. This had had a tremendous uh, impact on public opinion. So therefore there were still holdouts and uh, disagreement about what we had done turned out to be a very popular reception. So my 25 minutes are up. Let me just briefly conclude uh, by saying, I said at the very beginning that both sides achieved their major objectives. And I won't go over that, but it really was uh, far-sighted and courageous by both sides. And the ramifications have been felt ever since. So we left off to go on a long march, which is now proceeded for half a century, we've been over diverse terrain. There have been ups and downs, and in addition, indeed, it's been both sweet and sour. Perhaps the most pungent after today is opening. But it's also been largely a bipartisan march under eight presidents of both political parties. And Taiwan has not only survived, maintained its autonomy and security, it's become a dynamic economy and a flourishing democracy with an example not only to the world, but the mainland China. So historic developments are often hyped and overblown and inflated in their importance. But I think this journey has two realities. First, this really was the week that changed the world. And suddenly, our long ahead with China and any relationship will help to shape the world for the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ambassador Lord. It's great to see all those photographs. Thank you so much for sharing them. Uh, let's go now to uh, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, who was there for some of the same events and has his perspective. Over to you, Chaz. You have to unmute, Chaz. 
Okay. Um, a different perspective. I was a spear carrier uh, on the trip, um, not in the main meetings with Joe and I and, and Mao Zedong. Um, and uh, so I'll give you a, a different perspective, but I'll say uh, that I think Wynn and I probably at this point uh, share a common perception or a con an idea that we should never again be involved in a great historic moment because 50 years later you pay the price in terms of being mau mau by the Chinese press and others. Uh, <laughs> somebody asked the question offline whether this was being celebrated in China and the answer is emphatically yes. Uh, there's not any US government recognition of it that I'm aware of, uh, but uh, certainly uh, in China, it's uh, seen as a big deal. Um, I got interested in China when I was at the Harvard Law School. I think it was when I started to study taxation that I went to the Widener Library for relief and started reading history. I wasn't aware that uh, I had quite a family connection to China. Uh, three of my great grandfathers worked there at one point or another. One worked for Sun Yat-sen and designed the Three Gorges Dam, and as well as a lot of other things, including the MIT campus in Cambridge. Another, uh, whose ring I have, uh, uh, worked for Zhang Zhedong trying to modernize the Chinese steel industry. And a third one was one of the founders of the Social Science Department, what is now Beijing University. In any event, uh, uh, I knew I, I, I was very interested in China. It seemed to me that geopolitically, the geometry was all wrong. This was 1964, um, and that we would have to reach out to China. And I decided that uh, I'd like to be there when it happened. And lo and behold, uh, I was. Uh, I served in India, I learned Tamil. Uh, I very cleverly failed to report that to the State Department. Otherwise, I would have spent the rest of my career shuttling between what is now Chennai and uh, Colombo, uh, with good behavior being rewarded by a week or two in Singapore. Uh, eventually ended up in Taichung. Uh, I saw a dynamic uh, society in Taiwan undergoing uh, major transformation and modernization. And I was really very much more interested in, uh, in uh, being uh, reporting on Taiwan from the embassy in Taipei than I was in going to the mainland. Uh, but my language skills were good. So um, I uh, was uh, asked to uh, be the interpreter for the Warsaw talks, which were ambassador, ambassadorial level talks that went through 136 rounds. Uh, and at the end of which uh, uh, forecast uh, both uh, uh, the language that we ultimately came up with on Taiwan um, and the sending of a special emissary to Beijing, uh, as well as a possible presidential uh, visit. Uh, when I was asked to be the interpreter, I naturally went up to Taipei and read the records at the embassy. And so I was aware of what was going on. And I thought, my, uh, this is very important. I was suddenly called back to what was then called the Office of Asian Communist Affairs. We couldn't use the word China. Uh, for anything other than Taiwan, um, and set to work writing a whole series of papers uh, which were going somewhere I was not told, uh, but I, having read the record of the Warsaw talks, I knew they were going to the special emissary uh, we were going to send to uh, Beijing. Uh, these went to uh, John Holdridge and R Richard Solomon on the NSC staff, and uh, meantime, uh, I was involved in sending some of those signals, that public signals that Vin Lord mentioned. Um, and I remember the president making an announcement on currency use, uh, uh, which uh, uh, after which absolutely nothing happened. I got a call from the NSC when I go to speak to Stanley Summerfield, who was the head of the Office of Foreign Assets Control at the Treasury and persuade him to do what the president wanted. And uh, so I took him to lunch 
uh, and um, after a martini uh, that he, he drank, I didn't drink it much, um, uh, I asked him uh, why he had not implemented the president's instructions, which I pulled out and showed him. And his response was classic. He said, well, that may be the president's policy, but it's not the treasury's. Uh, and this is an indication of how very difficult it was uh, after 22 years of estrangement, having been institutionalized in the bureaucracies, not just on our side, but on the Chinese side, uh, to get uh, things moving. Uh, when the announcement of the 9 to 11 July uh, Kissinger trip uh, came out on the 15th. Um, I learned for the first time that it was Kissinger who was, was the special emissary, but I wasn't surprised by the announcement. Uh, later in the fall, um, I saw a bootleg copy or two of the draft communique, and I ended up ending up adding a couple of things, uh, opening trade and, and cultural exchange. Um, it's interesting because I now hear that the US was motivated by the China market, but it certainly was the last thing uh, on our mind at the time. It was all geopolitics. Um, in the fall, um, uh, advanced teams started going to uh, Beijing and um, one of them led by Ron Walker, later the head of the National Park Service, who had been Nixon's chief advance man during the campaign uh, went there, and that was a bit of a disaster. Uh, I think the, the, he got into an argument with uh, with Han Xu, who was then the acting chief of protocol, over how to deal with the press. Um, and uh, finally, Walker said, quote, I don't give a rat's ass what you think. We're going to do it my way. Um, it took Han Xu a moment to figure out what a rat's ass was. But when he did, uh, he basically stiff-armed Walker, and we had to send in the acting head of administration at the State Department, John Thomas, to straighten things out, which he did. Uh, the, toward the end of uh, 1971, I was locked up in the operations center, writing papers for those briefing books that Wynn mentioned. Um, I'm told, I don't know how this was calculated, but Someone told me I actually wrote 47% of the material that came from the Department of State. Um, somewhere along the line in then too, I, I got a request, or the State Department got a request for books for the president to read. He really was serious about his preparation. Um, and I gave him five of my books. Sorry, the light's gone out. I'm gonna have to wave my hands and hope that the light comes back on, yes. I'm in a borrowed office. Um, the, um, I gave him five books, one of which I remember was Emmanuel Xu's Masterly History of Qing China. Um, and um, after the trip, I asked for them back, but uh, I was, I suppose they're somewhere in San Clemente now, um, which I regret. Um, uh, nobody told me whether I was stab or roll on the trip or not. I found out when somebody shoved baggage tags through the mail slot in my house in Cleveland Park. Uh, and, um, uh, and then uh, somebody gave me a copy of Time Magazine, which profiled me with a lot of incorrect uh, data um, as the interpreter on the trip. Um, this was a little concerning. Nobody told me what I was to do. Uh, we went to California, picked up some uh, uh, Redwoods to be as a gift for Nixon during his visit to Hangzhou. There's somewhere along the line, Milton the Mux Muskox uh, was picked up. Quite a trade, I think. We got pandas and gave them a muskox. Um, that was uh, much, uh, much to our benefit, I would say. Um, and nowhere on the trip, uh, we went to uh, Hawaii next uh, few days, um, tried to help the Secretary of State master the material, which he did not really look at, um, and um, uh, didn't terribly succeed terribly well, I must say. Um, uh, and uh, I kept asking people, you know, what am I expected to do? Uh, what's my role? Um, nobody could tell me. Um, finally, I uh, 
after asking Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Ziegler, uh, Chapin, I met this skinny guy on the beach named um, Brent Scowcroft, and um, he said, you better ask Pat Buchanan. So I went and had a chat with him and uh, learned a few things. Got to Shanghai uh, via Guam, still didn't know what I was to do, um, uh, and uh, went on to Beijing, at which point we went to the Jiaotai State Guest House, and I was told the president wanted to see me and the other two guys who were backup interpreters, and we all went over. I hoped he would tell me what he wanted uh, me to do, but he just said, uh, you know, I've heard good things about you, and he had he, uh, I noticed he had uh, a lot of makeup on, which uh, was something I hadn't seen before outside a TV studio. Um, in fact, he had three black hairs coming out of a groove in his nose, which was right in my face. And on the end of one of them was a little blob of Max Factor. Uh, most impressive, but not very helpful. I went back to my guest house without having a clue what I was to do. He went off to see Chairman Mao, uh, which Wen has described mas masterfully. Um, as a result, the banquet, uh, welcoming banquet in Beijing, which had been scheduled for, I think, 7 o'clock, uh, was pushed back to 9.30. Around 8.30, I got a call to come over and see the president again. Of course, I didn't see him. I saw Dwight Chapin, his uh, appointments chief. And, and Chapin told me, he said, you know, the president wants you to interpret his banquet toast tonight. And I said, sure, fine, uh, may I see the text? Uh, and he said, well, there, I don't think there is a text. I said, well, I happen to know there is, so um, could you please go in and ask the president for the text? He went in, came out, and he said, the president says there is no text, and uh, he is going to do this extemporaneously. And I said, no way, and he said, and he orders you to interpret. And I said, Mr. Chapin, it might interest you to know that I did the draft for the toast tonight. And I'm aware that somebody in the White House has put some of Chairman Mao's poetry into it. And if you think I'm going to get up in front of the entire world and ad lib Chairman Mao's poetry from an unknown translation back into Chinese of some sort, you're out of your mind. And um, which point uh, Chapin gave the text, pulled the text out of his pocket and gave it to Tom Wanshan and uh, Qi Shaozhou, the two Chinese interpreters, uh, who then asked me, what's this poetry? And we worked on that together. And uh, they did a great job uh, with the toast, I think. Um, at any rate, I'm seated at the head table. Uh, Nixon was looking at, glaring at me with his jowls shaking. I figured I wouldn't, you know, my career was over. I'd be lucky to get a job in the Alaska Forest Service. And uh, at that point, Li Xianyan, who was later the president of China, that time vice premier, offered me a cigarette. I took it. So I know exactly where I began to smoke. And I smoked for the next 30 years. Um, Nixon didn't have a lot of small talk. And Joe and I, as Wynn noted, is remarkably, was remarkably graceful. So we had a number of conversations there, the most notable one of which occurred after I went out early in the morning to the New China Bookstore on Wangfujing to try to buy what an intelligence report had told me uh, had just been published, the 24 dynastic histories. Uh, or maybe even the one, the 25th, on the Republic of China. And of course, in the bookstore at that time, there was nothing but Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, although the little red book had been withdrawn because Lin Biao, uh, Mao's military lieutenant, uh, who had mounted a coup attempt, uh, had written the original preface, and so that was uh, no longer available. I ended up interpreting uh, for Secretary of State Rogers and Ji Feng Fei, his counterpart, um, in addition to, of course, social interpreting at uh, dinner tables and all that, um, where Secretary Rogers uh, 
told Ji Peng Fei endless stories about Sam Snead golf and Sam Snead's hat collection. And Ji Peng Fei, who was a veterinarian on the Long March, specializing, specializing in mules, um, didn't really know what golf was. So this was um, one of these moments that as an interpreter, you wish you didn't have to participate in. Um, the talks between the Secretary of State and its counterpart were, as is often the case at summit meetings, uh, not about pleasant things they'd seen and done or intended to do, but about all the disagreements we had. Uh, so we went at it about the war in Indochina, wars, I should say, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, in Korea, or the situation in Kashmir, uh, philosophical differences of the sort that Wynne mentioned. And um, uh, I thought Zhou Enlai's maneuver to include these in the Shanghai communique was a stroke of genius because it really did reassure people in the key capitals, uh, Seoul and Hanoi um, and, um, and uh, uh, Pyongyang and, and, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, Seoul, <laughs> Seoul and Pyongyang, uh, Saigon and, and, uh, and, and Hanoi and so forth, uh, that we had not sold them out, that we had held our ground, that our, our positions on these issues had not changed. And I must say that to this day, we continue in many respects to disagree uh, about these issues. In the end, as Wynne said, um, the trip was a great success. Um, the domestic contingent who came along, the president's domestic staff, uh, were ebullient about uh, the unexpected positive impact of it uh, back home. It really did give the president a boost for his reelection. But those of us concerned with foreign policy were also uh, elated uh, because we had achieved our objectives, which Wynne outlined very well, and which I will not recapitulate. What we did not understand at the time was that in addition to changing the geopolitical chessboard in ways that were very advantageous to the United States, in effect, extending protection to China so that it could not be removed by the Soviet Union from the chessboard, uh, we set in motion a process that fundamentally changed global political economy uh, with the re-emergence of China as a full participant in the American-sponsored post-World War II order. Uh, of course, this took uh, uh, quite a while. Uh, after the Nixon opening to China, the Shanghai Communique, uh, things soured on both sides. The Gang of Four uh, emerged on the Chinese side. Uh, on the US side, um, uh, Watergate occurred. It was a good thing that we agreed to establish and exchange liaison offices because this institutionalized the relationship in ways that enabled it to survive the turmoil and succession problems in both countries. Toward the end of the decade, of course, Deng Xiaoping, with help from Ye Jinying and others, managed to wrest power again. The Gang of Four was dismissed. And Deng Xiaoping cleverly used the United States for two purposes. First, of course, tactically, because he was determined to teach Vietnam that it could not build an empire to China's south in collaboration with the Soviet Union with impunity. Uh, so he had a curriculum he wished to administer to the Vietnamese, which he did. Uh, very successfully, they reached the right conclusion, although it cost China vastly more in blood and treasure than it had ever imagined it would have to pay. But the second thing that Don wanted openings and wanted for the opening to the United States was the use of the United States by sending students here by looking at American best practices. Uh, the use of the United States to de-Sovietize China. Basically, he used us in the opening that our opening to China provided to him for other countries uh, to correct 
the most repugnant aspects of the system uh, that uh, he had inherited. So this was the world, the week that changed the world, not only geopolitically at the time, uh, but in terms of global political economics and the effects of it are still with us. And I'll end here uh, and uh, turn it back to Susan. Great, thank you so much, Chaz. And if we can have Wynn uh, come back on camera and Andrew, who's our co-moderator here, uh, we'll get to some of the questions uh, that some of the audience members have been uh, frenetically sending in, um, and also some of the questions that have been burning in the minds of uh, Andrew and myself as we've been discussing our preparations for this event and all of the things we wanted to ask you about. Um, you both mentioned, and I had a question about um, the sort of secrecy of the mission and the public packaging, but I think uh, both uh, you, uh, Chaz and Wynn, have both uh, talked about that. So um, I think, you know, given the focus that you both put on Taiwan, I would like to ask a question about um, the issue of Taiwan in the Shanghai communique and, and how you see it today. Um, of course, the artful phrase of the Shanghai communique was the United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. It reaffirms its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves and the intention to withdraw military forces as tensions in the area diminish. Um, and this, you know, uh, phrase has been the subject of, of course, when I was in the State Department working on China and Taiwan issues, you know, there was this sort of awe and appreciation for the artfulness and the ambiguity that was in the Shanghai communique that created so much space for diplomacy to move forward that um, kind of set <coughs> up a situation that was able to be prolonged for so many years. <coughs> and I want to um, just ask you kind of how you see the evolution of this policy today, whether you think that that original artfulness um, has held up, do you, uh, how do you think about the arguments today about, you know, the need uh, to get rid of some of the ambiguity surrounding this question and how do you see this situation uh, with Taiwan uh, going forward? And any suggestions you have for um, the administration on this difficult issue, I'm sure uh, would be appreciated because it <clears throat> is really truly a, 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 a tricky issue to handle still today. Maybe Wynn, do you wanna start? Yeah, I'll take a crack at it. First of all, I think the China and Taiwan policy of eight presidents of both parties, including the Taiwan factor, has been one of the major success stories in American diplomacy, despite all the revisionism and nitpicking about formulas. The fact is, as I said earlier, for 50 years, Taiwan has prospered, secure, economic, a democracy, and yet we've been able to move ahead with China at the same time. That is no mean, no mean achievement. Today, as you say, with Chinese pressures on Taiwan, many are calling for getting rid of our strategic ambiguity. Basically, that is based on the Taiwan Relations Act, which says, in effect, we're very concerned about security of Taiwan. If something bad happens, we're going to see what we're going to do about it. So it's not an ironclad commitment for those in the audience who may not be familiar, but it does threaten American intervention. There are many are calling today because of Chinese pressures and aggressiveness generally, should we be more clear to deter China? I think it's fair to debate that, but I come out strongly against maintaining strategic ambiguity for several reasons. First of all, if you clarify, we're definitely gonna defend Taiwan, then you can just forget our relations with China, essentially, because that's breaking. And we've stretched our communiques and agreements, uh, I think feasibly, but this would actually break it. But leaving that aside, uh, 
the Chinese are stepping up their pressures, their military exercises, their diplomatic isolation, their economic pressure. But this is designed, in my view, um, the Eastern here, Chaz's view, to deter formal independence. China is not going to invade Taiwan. It's a huge risk for Xi. He'd lose office if he failed the economic consequences. He can't be sure about American intervention. Japan, Australia, France, others are getting interested in the Taiwan issue. Crossing 100 miles and attacking an island is not an easy feat, no matter what the balance of power is. And it's like the dog chasing a car. They go and they occupy Taiwan. The dog catches up to the car. Then what does it do? They're not going to invade Taiwan. Now, they may squeeze them more economically. Uh, they may do something with the offshore islands, but we should not change uh, ambiguities. To finish my answer, and I'm sorry to take so long, but in terms of policy, maintain ambiguity. Increase the turns by continual consultations with other Asians interested in this. Continue to sell arms to Taiwan. Make sure they do arms that are good for defense, and not for prestige purposes. Maintain high-level visits, avoiding the most sensitive ones. Open up a free trade arrangement. Continue to press for Taiwan's participation in international organizations. They're at the Democracy Summit. They're part of an Indo-Pacific strategy. Put all that together, that's sufficient deterrence, and let's maintain the ambiguous resolution that we've had for 50 years. Thank you very much. Chaz, um, what, what is your thought on this very important well, question? I completely agree with Wynne that this has been a major success policy for the United States and for Taiwan. Um, and uh, I note that uh, in the 1980s, uh, the, after the normalization of relations between the, Washington and Beijing, there was a tremendous relaxation of tensions in the Taiwan Strait, which enabled the democratization of Taiwan, uh, and which at the end of the decade produced a political dialogue between Beijing and Taipei. Uh, that is the process of peaceful resolution of this issue by the two Chinese parties to the Chinese Civil War got underway. I, I, I attribute much of that to American policy. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think that over this period, uh, there has been an enormous amount of salami slicing on the US side with regard to specific commitments that were made in the three communiques. And I note that uh, Hua Chunying, the Chinese uh, spokeswoman who for the foreign ministry uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, for the first time uh, that I can recall, recited in detail all of the specific uh, US commitments in the communiques, uh, saying that the US had uh, failed to live up to these. Um, and uh, I think this was a deliberate move by the Chinese in response to the fact that virtually no one in the United States, with the exception of perhaps those uh, now on this screen, um, uh, has actually read the three communiques or has any idea what's in them. Uh, they haven't read the Taiwan Relations Act either. Um, and um, these have the status of, uh, it, this is like when Americans refer to the constitution, you know, they've never read it. And they attribute all sorts of things to it that aren't in there. Now, so I think the Chinese are now deliberately reminding us of what we agreed to and encouraging us to try to recall it ourselves. Um, deterrence. It cannot be purely military. For this period, the deterrence was provided by the understanding, the diplomatic understandings that Win and uh, helped to craft back 50 years ago uh, and by subsequent uh, communiques. Um, it wasn't military deterrence that kept the peace in the Taiwan Strait. Now we have a situation where the deterrence is purely military. Part of deterrence is supposed to be reassurance of the other side. If you don't do this, we won't do that. But there is no such assurance. And I agree completely with Wynne uh, in saying in a, that to reduce the ambiguity of the American commitment, 
would, uh, have, would accomplish only two things. It would enrage the Chinese, perhaps to the point where they would try to use force, uh, and it would encourage people in Taiwan to push the envelope further. Uh, and I think neither is in our interest. So um, let me just say one final thing, and that is uh, I'm not as convinced as the conventional wisdom has it uh, that Taiwan could not be taken militarily uh, by the PLA. Um, we think of the Normandy landing, landing craft. This is the age of helicopters. Um, we think of aircraft but this is the age of missiles. Um, I won't go into detail, I could, but I don't think that a military planner in Beijing would agree that this is an infeasible objective. Having said that, I think the last thing on earth people in Beijing want is a war over Taiwan or to have to occupy a hostile population in Taiwan. Um, that is, it's not just Sun Tzu who prefers winning without fighting. It's any intelligent person. Uh, and there are a lot of intelligent men and women in Beijing focusing on this question. I, I think we have to be very careful, where I do differ with Wynn, is in continuing to elevate the profile of Taiwan internationally and in our own treatment. It is now very difficult to tell what the difference is between an official and an unofficial relationship. There is a $230 million building in Taipei that looks like an embassy, flies a flag, and has Marine guards. Um, we agreed that we would not have official relations. Uh, we agreed we would withdraw all our troops and installations, but there are now troops apparently back in Taiwan. Uh, we agreed we would annul our defense commitment, but as your question pointed out, and as Wynn, uh, I think, very correct, correctly refuted, there are now many voices raised suggesting that we reinstate a, a defense commitment. Uh, so I think this relationship is, the, this issue is on the edge. It is very dangerous. Um, and uh, it's not, not for me to try to interpret um, you know, whether we were or were not faithful to our, our commitments. The problem is that the Chinese are interpreting us as not having been. Uh, and the lack of trust is a basic barrier to renegotiating some further modus vivendi that could keep the pace for an extended time. Uh, one quick comment. Uh, Chaz and I agree on a lot. Where we disagree, we can do that bilaterally. We want to get to other questions. I do want to elaborate quickly on one point he made correctly and I left out. Another reason not to end ambiguity is if you have an irresponsible Taiwan leader, which we do not have now, President Tsai, I think, is very responsible, is preventing the extremist parts of her party from going toward independence. But a future Taiwan leader, if he knows we're going to come to Taiwan's defense no matter what, could be very provocative and drag us into a war. So that's another reason to maintain ambiguity. But why don't we go on to other issues? Okay, great. No, I, I, I want to hand over to Andy here because I know he's got questions and we've got questions from the audience. But if we get a chance in the next uh, few minutes um, to have uh, some reflection on the so-called reverse Kissinger that people are talking about now, um, you know, the idea that when uh, President Nixon and, and Dr. Kissinger went to China, they were pulling China away from the Soviet Union and creating this uh, triangulation against the Soviet Union, so to speak. It, given the situation now in Ukraine and with Russia and the deteriorating relations between Russia and the West, um, you know, is there, there's a lot of discussion, of course, of China's relations with Russia, et cetera. But, you know, how do you, how do you interpret this kind of, talk uh, in the current context of the current crisis. But I do want to, while you ponder that, let me turn it over to Andy, because I know he's got a, a couple of questions as well. Well, thanks, Susan. And actually, you've anticipated uh, at least two of the questions that have come from the audience on, you know, on, on uh, the, the, the current state of the triangulation, you know, in the era of uh, 
of, uh, of Putin and, uh, and Ukraine. Um, I wanted to ask a question, if I could, to, to, to both of you, to uh, both of you, Wynn and Chaz, uh, regarding the Shanghai communique. Um, and one of the things that, and, and, and I think both of you articulated why it is so uh, unique and important, and I particularly am fascinated by the, uh, the way in which it came about. Um, you know, just the process of um, it, it coming out of a meeting where, I guess, Mao berated Joe and <laughs> Joe berated uh, uh, the, the U.S. team. But I, so my question is, uh, you know, about that is, you know, the, the current state of uh, uh, Sino-U.S. relations, does it preclude this kind of acknowledgement to agree to disagree uh, for the sake of our you know, larger uh, bilateral relationship, because one of the wonderful things about the communique is that it had embedded in it, just by, by the way in which it was structured, this, this uh, notion of credibility, uh, signaling not only to each other, but to our respective domestic uh, 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 political uh, groups and, and our allies, um, you know, what, exactly what we were doing and exactly what we weren't doing. Um, and as a, as a clarifying document, it really does strike me as being sometimes this, this idea of uh, not just focusing on where, you know, where our interests intersect, but where they diverge uh, could actually be a very, very useful um, uh, way of communicating outward. Well, let me take a crack and I'll try to keep my answers briefer so we get to more questions. Uh, there's no way we're going to have, in my view, a formal document now like the Shanghai Communique. The world has changed. China, above all, has changed. It's too complicated. Our domestic publics are increasingly hostile and nationalistic. It's very tricky. I do think, though, there's a basic principle we should preserve, and that is to break down our issues with China into three categories. Uh, and I think, actually, the Biden administration is inching toward this. One of those areas where we have total differences we're not going to resolve. That would include Taiwan, it would include human rights. You're going to have to manage those, postpone them, make sure you have guardrails and rules of the road so you don't stumble into conflict. Neither side is going to be able to say it's off the table. It's too important for both sides, but essentially de facto, those are on ice, even as you maintain your position. Then you've got a whole series of the third area, the second area of competition, peaceful, one, we should be self-confident in given our assets and China's problems. If we can get our act together at home, that's a big if. So whether it's economics, technology, or others, insist on certain norms and international laws with China, but compete peacefully. Then there's a third area of cooperation, mostly on global issues, which we should seek out, like pandemics, climate change, non-proliferation, uh, where we in China have common interests, where the world needs us two big countries to try to solve this problem. And these are areas we should work with China on, both as an end in itself, but also to inject some stability into an otherwise tense relationship. Chinese statecraft, which goes back a couple of thousand years at least, um, has a phrase, chiu tong sun yi, now, to seek common ground while reserving differences. Uh, that is what the Shanghai communique uh, embodied. Uh, it's very consistent with Chinese negotiating philosophy. Um, I think it's very important that the United States do two things. First, stop emulating wolf warrior diplomacy uh, by restoring a measure of respect and dignity and politeness to our dialogue with the Chinese. Uh, Chinese culture puts a, puts a huge emphasis on face, which is the self-esteem you derive from the respect of others whom you respect. We are demonstrating disrespect with very negative results. Uh, second, I don't agree with Wynne about the order of the issues, although I do agree with him about the structure. Um, I think what happened in 1971-72 was that we put cooperation first. We looked for where we could cooperate. We recognized that in some areas we would be competing and in some areas we would be adversaries. Um, I think that's the correct order. If you want to solve problems, you don't start off by saying 
you're a moral reprobate. I detest you. Uh, I, if I can put you down, I will. But by the way, I have a few things I need your help on. Would you, uh, would you give me a break? Uh, this is pretty much the recent, I'm sorry to say Trump and Biden, uh, so foreign policy team approach. And I don't think it will work. I think uh, it's very important to say at the outset, look, there, there are some things, I'll name some, climate change, pandemic management, economic prosperity management, non-proliferation, uh, these multi multinational planet-wide issues. There are even bilateral, there are even specific issues like the Korean question, where we have common interests and we should cooperate. There are other interests, other areas where we're bound to be competitors. Like when I'm a little worried that we're not getting our act together. Uh, sometimes think we look more like the you know, old guy sitting in the hot tub smoking pot while the Chinese are out on the track trying out equipment and, and training. Um, finally, uh, of course, there are some things where we're absolutely opposed to each other and, and we have to recognize that. But I would say put cooperation first. Well, let me just a quick comment because with all due respect, Chad, the fact that I mentioned the problems first, I wasn't putting them in order of priority. It's just my instinct is that if you, you can't get to the good stuff unless you, you can clear away the underbrush. But so this was not my order of priority. Uh, no, second, I, 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 think it, I think it is, however, the administration's well, litany, I, I, and I don't uh, agree with it. Um, yeah, I, I do think there's a difference between Biden and Trump. Uh, Again, I won't have time for more questions, but both have been firmer on China than we used to be, and I think for good reason, because China's been aggressive abroad, uh, repressive at home and interfering in other countries. And I'd say the current tense relationship is mostly their fault, but we can debate that. But the fact is the Biden people would, I think, also like to have a more stable relationship. And in, whether it's Chinese scientists or students or investment, they're using scalpels and not machetes. There's not hysteria here that you had under Trump. And above all, the Biden administration recognizes that the most important thing for our relations with China is the context. And they're focusing, in my view, correctly on three elements, all of which distinguish it from Trump uh, and don't have to be antagonistic to China per se. Number one, get our act together at home so we can improve our hard power and invest to be competitive in areas like infrastructure, advanced technology, use this as a Sputnik moment to wake ourselves up and get our act together and soft power so that democracy could be shown to functioning, competing with the Chinese model. Secondly, work with friends and allies. Don't make them choose sides, but combine with them for leverage on Beijing on issues like trade uh, and human rights. And thirdly, leadership in international institutions. If you get those three elements correct, you can then deal with China much more effectively. And of course, I've worked for 50 years and I will continue to seek a more stable relationship, but I think it requires a discretionary firmness that Biden is showing versus the hysteria and bludgeoning of Trump. Well, um, when I'll, I, I'll accept all that. I mean, after all, you, are, you were a registered Republican for a long time. That's right. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm left wing not talking here. <laughs> I mean, Reagan appointed me as ambassador. I worked with Nixon. Quite. By the way, I have to say this and then we'll get back and I want to get into politics. The single biggest threat to our China policy is the Republican Party. I'll just leave it at that. If people want to get back to me and that we can do it. All right. Well, th this is this is fascinating, and um, I'm I'm really glad to have the two of you in dialogue with one another. I think this is great for our audience. Would either one of you like to take on this Russia question? Because I think probably several people in the audience are, and I am dying to know what the two of you uh, think and what you would advise the Biden administration to do at this point, given China's position. Well, let me say the following. The, there's no question that China and Russia are closer together than they have been since the 1950s. I would argue it's fundamentally tactical and a big problem for us, but not strategic. Let me explain. 
they have many common interests. They both are communist, autocrat, semi-dictators. They both resist and worry about outside influences trying to make their country more democratic. They both want to reduce America's world. They both feel that past history has humiliated them and whether it's Ukraine or Taiwan, they want to regain what they should uh, to have. Uh, they have some interest in trade, uh, energy, raw materials, military supplies. Uh, they both oppose sanctions, et cetera. So there are some common interests. There was a major statement during the Olympics between the two, in which their friendship had no limits and so on. China has supported Russia in terms of not expanding NATO, but it has carefully not supported the Ukraine operation. In fact, their foreign minister two days ago said all countries should have sovereignty, including Ukraine. So they're going to do a balancing act uh, as they usually do in these in the UN and elsewhere where they'll call for peace and negotiations, but they'll help the Soviets weather sanctions. So whether it's in the UN or around the world, this tactical alliance is of concern and it's a challenge. But let me end by saying, I don't think we have to worry about it in the long run. They're bordering countries with a history of clashes, uh, open Siberia and a big Chinese population. The Russians at times are semi-racist. They have different views and interests uh, in Central Asia. China can't be happy with the president or a precedent of one country invading another country. They've got uh, their own history. Their trade between them is minuscule compared to their interest and need to deal with the United States, Japan, and Europe. Uh, and so, and one is a declining power and one's a rising power. Uh, this is not going to be a tight alliance, but it does greatly complicate the near-term geopolitical chessboard. Um, I uh, hate to be academic, <laughs> but um, I think uh, actually we have a major problem in that we've lost the classical vocabulary and terminology of diplomacy. The word ally is thrown about in so many different contexts that it's essentially meaningless. Uh, what the Russians and the Chinese have put together is an entente. That is a limited partnership for limited purposes, very likely for a limited time. Um, and that entente, unfortunately, is concentrated on, our, on undoing our hegemony. Uh, because we have been pushing both of them, in their view, uh, uh, very hard. And we have succeeded in pushing them together. We lump them together in terms of our uh, notion that the world is organized around a contest between democracy and authoritarianism, which I don't agree with. And we lump them together as great power rivals, by which we really mean um, uh, adversarial and, and, and animosity rather than rivalry, meaning unhealthy competition where we try to hurt the other side in order to get ahead rather than improving our own performance. Um, it's no secret uh, the Russians since 1994 have been registering exactly the same objections to the extension of the American sphere of influence in Europe through NATO to their borders. Um, I have heard from uh, from, from the Russians and reading carefully what Mr. Putin says, I do not agree that he is trying to incorporate Ukraine into a Russian sphere of influence. I think he is trying to deny it to the American sphere of influence. Now, whether that limited objective holds will depend on the dynamics that now ensue. Uh, so uh, what I see from the Chinese, which is the topic of the evening, is exactly as when said, there's a balancing act. On the one hand, the Chinese are the last citadel of Westphalianism in the 21st century. Um, they are great defenders of national sovereignty against foreign intervention and interference. Uh, and they cannot agree with the Russians having any right to intervene uh, in Ukraine. On the other hand, uh, they do not agree with the concept of spheres of influence and they see the United States having extended a sphere of influence, as I said, right up to Russia's borders. Ironically, two days ago, the State Department spokesman at the same moment when he was denying 
that uh, the Russians had any right to establish a sphere of influence, which of course they have in military terms in Central Asia still, uh, reaffirmed the Monroe Doctrine and condemned the Russians for having meetings with the presidents of Brazil and uh, Venezuela and other countries. So uh, I think we can have it both ways. Uh, and I think we are paying a price uh, for uh, pushing the Russians and Chinese together, and that was not smart. Um, I don't think we can peel the Russians off now from the Chinese, uh, but I think we could allow the natural differences between them, which when pointed to, uh, to have a chance of expressing themselves and complicating the relationship a little bit. And I'll end by noting, as Wynne Win referred uh, correctly to, a bit of Russian racism, uh, there's a bit of it on the Chinese side too, uh, and it has an historic basis. After the fall of the Ming in 1642, uh, the uh, Forbidden City and its zoo, the emperor's zoological and botanical gardens, were looted. And uh, shortly after, they, you know, the, the, toward the end of the decade, uh, the new Qing dynasty sent uh, an expedition, scientific expedition to Siberia to collect samples of the flora and fauna. Um, and they encountered the first Cossacks to have reached that area of uh, the Eurasian landmass. Um, and unfortunately, the Cossacks were hungry and they ate some of the Chinese scientists who returned to Beijing to report that there were hairy cannibals up there. Um, so I don't think this was a good start to U.S to Chinese-Russian relations. And I agree, there's a lot of a reason to suspect that if they had the opportunity, if we weren't pressing them together, they might find uh, a few differences they're now able to obscure. Well, we should go on to other questions, uh, but sometime uh, we, Chaz and I will sit down. Uh, there's just too many mea culpas there. Uh, too little uh, attention, I think, to forces of democracy versus others, and I don't think we've been pushing them together, but let's leave that aside so we can get on to other questions. I, I wish I could spend uh, uh, at least a few more uh, 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 minutes, if not hours, on the, um, the, 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 the Russia-China origin story that, uh, that Chaz laid out, but uh, let, let me actually draw from one of the other points um, that you made, and, and this is for both of you. Um, this idea about the language of diplomacy. Um, and I'm going to kind of recast one of the questions here because I, I, I recall in, in doing my homework for this event, one of the things that you, Chaz, remarked about with the Chinese translation of the Shanghai communique was that they were actually quite generous uh, in terms of how they interpreted the language. Um, and that strikes me. So the, the, the question that's here is, you know, how did, uh, how did the Chinese try to knock the Americans off balance? Um, you know, and there were any number of, of occasions where, 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 where that occurred, but it, it seemed like the language in which, uh, you know, the, 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 the communique itself was articulated was not one of them. And is that different from the current um, use of kind of creative interpretations or kind of multiple meanings in terms of not simply uh, uh, papering over ambiguity, but also in terms of um, uh, essentially uh, putting in a linguistic Trojan horse, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, pushing one's uh, uh, agenda into the language of an agreement, if that makes sense. Because there didn't seem to be that in, 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 in your experience back then. No, I think uh, the communique was negotiated in English, basically. Um, so I was very attentive to the Chinese text when I, when I saw it. Um, I do think the Chinese were scrupulously fair in their rendering of the nuances of the English. And that is not easy. Let me just make a couple of remarks about the problems of interpreting and translation between these two languages. Um, the United States uh, is part of the West. And the West is part of the domain of Max Weber. And Max Weber came up with the idea of having words that were wertfrei, uh, value free. Um, and positivism uh, spent a lot of time erasing uh, emotional 
baggage from the vocabularies we use. That did not happen in China. So if I say in English, uh, Andy Murtha defected to size. Um, uh, in Chinese, I have to say whether that was to chang or to di, was it a correct defection to the right side or was it an, a villainous defection to the other, to the wrong side? Um, and there are, quite aside from that sort of issue, which came up in the talks with uh, the, at the Secretary of State level, where the word for deterrence that the Chinese used was essentially very ag aggressive, meaning almost compellence. And I objected. Um, it's taken them 30 years, but they've now come up with a decent rendering, uh, to uh, intimidate and halt. Um, but uh, there are just inherent differences. Uh, one incident, I'll end here. Um, the Chinese interpreter uh, rendered uh, the words parallel policies as Bing Xing Bu Bei de Zhongzhe. Bing Xing Bu Bei means two lines that proceed without ever meeting. Uh, that is a mathematical definition of parallel. But in diplomacy, parallel does not mean that. It means we are traveling in the same direction toward the same ends. Uh, so I objected and they accepted my objection. I proposed itu uh, to travel different paths to the same destination. Uh, this is, these are two languages where the overlap in meaning is often not as great as it is in Indo-European languages. Uh, and uh, that, that is one reason that one should pay attention to interpreters interpreting and translation uh, because honest mistakes can be made. Uh, two quick points. Uh, I want to point out that Murtha's defection was evil because I went to Fletcher. So that, that's a real problem. Secondly, uh, and I want to emphasize with Chas that the Chinese did a terrific job on the translation as opposed to our experience with the Russians who would always try to really go out of the way to, to screw you in terms of their translations. We have to be very meticulous with the Chinese. If there was a, a choice of words in the communique, and Chaz would know better than I do, they, they sort of leaned to one that was even better, uh, better for us. It's so interesting because, I mean, the language, and I'm so glad you brought that up, uh, both of you, um, is, is, you know, you feel when you're working on these relationships, a lot of what happens is in English. And I just have such incredible awe and admiration for the vast number of Chinese interlocutors that speak English very well and that they can negotiate in English. I don't know if people realize how difficult that is for a non-native English speaker, but it is quite an advantage that, uh, that, we, get, that we get to negotiate in our, our native language. It also probably is the explanation behind how much miscommunication and misperception there is between the U.S. and China. Um, due to, uh, to some extent, language, culture, and other things, which I think we've probably all felt. Um, I wanted, though, uh, when to go uh, direct one of our audience questions to you, because you have a lot of background in human rights issues, and you mentioned uh, human rights as one of the uh, issues that you would probably put in that third basket. And the question from uh, the audience is about how can you compartmentalize um, or how can you handle human rights um, in the context of, you know, the vast trading relationship that we have and in an environment of globalization where China is so present in our everyday lives. And the example they are raising is the, um, the uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which is um, going to I think be quite intrusive in terms of uh, U.S.-China trade. Is this um, a way to handle human rights or is it better to try to treat these things on separate tracks? I mean, how do you think this issue of Xinjiang or just the issue of human rights in general has evolved over the time that you've been looking at these questions or, or do you have a, a, a 
suggestion or an approach that might be uh, better than than what we've seen to date. Uh, how many more hours have we got? Yeah, here? I know. No, I'll, we, I'll got, we got 15 minutes, so I know. Anyway, we got I don't, time. Wanna, let me try to be quick on this. It's the single biggest challenge, in my view, in diplomacy is how you balance off issues like values and human rights and realpolitik and economic interests. Obviously, in the opening in the 70s, we were aware of how ruthless the Chinese were, but we had nuclear world around us. We had preserving the world as a human right. So we obviously had to relegate that. In my view, you're always going to have to factor in promoting democracy as part of your foreign policy, including with China, to maintain domestic support, to give encouragement to reformers in other countries, uh, and, and to have an organizing principle. But you've got to modulate how much priority it takes. And much as I think it should be part of our approach to China, it cannot dominate it. Uh, we have geopolitical security, global interests that just have to uh, have to take precedent in most cases. It doesn't mean you ignore it. For, for the reasons I've mentioned, you've got to stand for it. And I would be selective in terms of sanctions when it's as egregious as the Xinjiang situation is. Uh, but even there, you've got to be using a scalpel and not a machete, as I said. So I think we should continue to stand for it. I think we should try to ally with our like-minded democracies for leverage purposes. I think above all, though, we got to get our own act together. We're not looking very good as a democracy ourselves. And that's why I say the Republican Party, I don't want to go into detail, but unless we can fix our own democracy, both in terms of functioning and in terms of a model, uh, we're much less reasonable posture in telling others what to do. So I would maintain it as part of our agenda, but it cannot dominate our agenda. Yeah, I'm reminded of, of Joe Nye's great, um, you know, piece and book on soft power, the power to get other countries to want what you want. And um, we've got to we've got to do a lot of work at home before we can be that city on a hill that can have the power to get other countries to want what we want. I think at this point we are we need that work. Um, Chaz, do you have any thoughts on this um, on this issue on the balancing of maybe not just human rights and geopolitics, but, you know, sometimes I felt when I was in the State Department that I wanted to sprinkle Ritalin over the White House um, to try to get them to focus on sort of the things that were important and not, you know, be rushing off after every kind of, you know, this day's or this minute's crisis. Um, do, is, there, is there a way that you can uh, think of sort of advising on balancing and prioritizing all of the various issues that we have with China, never mind with the rest of the world, but, um, and where does human rights fit in your picture? Uh, well, I would point out that Nixon wasn't a great apostle of human rights. Uh, that came with Jimmy Carter. And I think we lost the balance that when described as necessary at that point. Every country has to rally its domestic public in support of policies. And one of the things that powers rhetoric is ideology. In the case of the United States, um, its human rights plays a big role, even though our own record on that uh, is pretty spotty, to put it mildly. Um, I think the main problem we have now, for example, on issues like Xinjiang, um, you know, I speak Arabic, I keep in touch with people in that section of the world, is uh, frankly that our outrage is selective. We don't talk about Kashmir, uh, where terrible things are happening. We don't talk about Chechnya. We don't talk about the Palestinians. Um, and uh, it's hardly uh, what's happening in Xinjiang is bad, uh, but to the extent that we appear to focus on that as part of a broader China bashing strategy, we lose credibility. Uh, so I think it is important to balance um, uh, harder objectives, if you will, uh, with, with values and fidelity to them. But I think we have to be more consistent, more consistent. Thank so you. I think, 
Thanks. I, I think we've got time for, for uh, one more question, maybe two, but if it's, uh, if it's one, I'm going to channel uh, one of them that um, um, talks about uh, U.S.-China uh, collaboration. And I'll, I'll just articulate it at different, uh, I will articulate it differently in that, you know, one of the kind of no-brainer areas of cooperation between the U.S. and China, one would have thought before 2020, was in pandemic response. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it turns out um, <laughs> it, uh, expectations for optimism were, were, were wildly um, unrealistic. Um, I'm curious as to uh, both of your opinions as to what went wrong, and I guess more to the point of the question, why in an area where cooperation would seem natural and maybe even organic, did it uh, did, did things so so badly fall off the rails? Not only in the initial responses, because you know, in the definition of a of, of an emergency is almost a, 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 a an inability to deal with it effectively. At its at its source, but uh, so not just the initial response, but just everything that has still uh, kind of came in its wake. So um, uh, I don't know which which one of you would like to, to to respond first. Well, I'll make a general comment and then a specific one <clears throat> on all these global issues like pandemic, climate change, nonproliferation. These are in the mutual self interest of our two countries. And so we should not fall into the trap, which the Chinese may try to do, and particularly on climate change, to say, well, we'll cooperate here, but you've got to help us in this other issue. It's in their own self-interest. Uh, and so we should not have these global issues contingent on cooperation in other areas, although sometimes it's hard to cut out the noise. On the pandemic itself, uh, it seems to me that cooperation, I still would like to see cooperation. We have such a clear interest, not only in the current pandemic, but preventing future ones. But you have to lay the blame on the Chinese in this one. I mean, it originated from China. I don't subscribe to all the right-wing, Fauci, uh, China did this on purpose uh, theories by any means. But they certainly have been covering up with however it started. They will not let the WHO have sensible inspections. So it's extremely difficult to cooperate with China when, when it came from China, I don't even tell you what they know, uh, makes it almost impossible. Um, the Trump administration withdrew the CDC people who were in Wuhan and elsewhere. Um, so there was not a propitious uh, atmosphere for exchange of information. The Chinese are inherently untransparent. I agree that was a problem. Uh, however, I think the fundamental issue here is, uh, to go back to the basic question, uh, this became a subject of demagoguery in the United States. The Kung flu, the Wuhan flu, flu Wuhan virus, da 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 the right-wing conspiracies that prosper on social media, you know, where the companies involved have a business plan that relies upon discovering your prejudices and allying you with people with similar prejudices, whether you want to be allied with them or not. Um, and uh, this creates petri dishes in which conspiracy theories and false narratives prosper. I think there's an answer to this, however. Uh, one of the tricks of the diplomacy that you learn over the years is that if you can't cooperate directly, often you can go back to Itu Tongwe, you can often work in parallel. Um, so if we could agree with the Chinese that we both have an interest in stopping whatever disease next emerges from, let's say, West Africa or the Democratic Republic of the Congo or South China or India or wherever, dense human populations are in contact with animal vectors, then I think we could find a ways uh, to work, not at cross purposes, but um, in, in, in a common endeavor. And that is what I would favor. I also think it's important to restore the communication between the CDC on our side and the Chinese equivalent. This is not the last pandemic. There are eight 
billion people on the planet now. This is a biological mass that invites invasion by viruses and bacteria. And you can damn well bet that we'll see more of it. I will ask one very last self-indulgent question because we have maybe a couple moments. Um, getting back to the historical um, uh, part of the, of the program, I'm very curious uh, because you've interacted personally with some of these you know, real giants of, of, of history on the Chinese side. Um, are there any aspects of um, the leaders that you did interact with, um, either uh, during the, um, you know, the, the, the 72 visit uh, or, or, or thereafter, that we, um, uh, are, that we get wrong um, in terms of how we understand and interpret um, or, or describe kind of what, what it is that made them who they are? Yes, well, I was fortunate to be in all five meetings with Mao, uh, hundreds of hours with Joe and Lai, and every meeting in the 70s with the two of them and Deng Xiaoping in the U.S. side, so I've had a close look. I, I would say the public perception of Mao and Joe, which we're talking about now, relatively accurate. I would, I would say in the case of Mao, what probably really isn't understood is his elusive quality in communication. I pointed out he's using brush strokes rather than clear so he would use similes, analogies, folk stories, self-deprecation, and it was ambiguous sometimes. And either he was brilliant and you were a stupid barbarian, or he was getting senile, uh, particularly as he went along in the five meetings. Uh, for example, he once said to Kissinger, uh, I would like to send 10 million Chinese women to the United States. Now, Henry and I couldn't quite figure that out. So I got home and I asked my Chinese wife and she said immediately, he's having trouble with his wife, Madame Mao. And more broadly, he's having some resistance. Mm -hmm. And whether that's the right explanation, I, I don't know, but that made as much sense to Henry as the rest of us. As the meetings went on, the five meetings, he got more and more uh, frail. And toward the last couple, including with President Ford, he was actually grunting for about 10 or 15 or <clears throat> 30 seconds. Nancy Tang would then give a four minute translation. Mm -hmm. And so we were a little puzzled by this. And so we figured he was told Nancy, number one is our Taiwan policy. Number two is our Vietnam policy. Number three is our Soviet policy. I'll give you the number, then you'll give the policy. That was probably what was happening in our view. Uh, finally, uh, the uh, best example of not understanding Mao was President Ford. I say this with respect for him and affection. He did his country a great service. But in his meeting with Mao, he, he went to the meeting and Mao greeted him and said, he was very sick, he said, I will soon get an invitation from God. Now Ford was a little puzzled by this. Anyway, we had the meeting. And as Ford was leaving, he shook the chairman's hand. He said, thank you for a very good meeting. And I want you to know, I hope you get that invitation from God. <laughs> now, the uh, Chinese translator, I'm sure, said the chairman wishes you 10,000, I mean, the president wishes you 10,000 years. Now, quickly on Joe and Lai, I think his charm and sense of humor may not be understood by much of the world. Now, both the leaders are ruthless, Let's not kid ourselves, but I'm giving you certain qualities. There was one meeting in which uh, Kissinger and Joe were having a historical discussion beyond their agenda. Uh, Chaz knows about this. Kissinger asked Joe and Lai, what is the impact of the French Revolution? Now, I was there, and I know Kissinger meant the 1790s. Joe and Lai came back and said, ah, it's too early to tell, which is the Chinese way of saying, we take the long view. We got 4,000 history, you guys take the short view. Now, Chaz is going to try to ruin my story by saying <laughs> this was about the, the French demonstrations in the streets uh, in the 1968, wherever it was. Uh, but I refused to have the story ruined, and I had the advantage, Chaz. <laughs> I was actually, actually there. Yeah, Two other I points about Joe and I, his charm. 
one of our staff got sick in one of the trips, he sent his personal doctors. And then the final example of his subtlety was we were finishing up on one of our trips, uh, meeting with Joe, and it was the last night. Before that meeting, for three days, we had been in the guest house, and Henry and I would always walk around the grounds to discuss strategy because we knew we were being bugged in the guest house, which had its advantages because I was like to say I didn't like sea slugs and therefore I was sure that we wouldn't get sea slugs that night. But every time we tried to cross a bridge, a PLA soldier popped up and stopped us. And we didn't know why. Three days later, Joe and I, at the end of the final meeting, without saying a word, without his being told anything about our frustrations, walked us back to our guest house clearly in protocol terms, amazing in itself, and walk this over that bridge. So see, these are some of the subtleties and charm uh, and the characteristics of the two leaders. We're out of time. Um, I won't refute when, although it was about the 1968 Paris comment. <laughs> I'll just make one comment, because uh, I think he's very nicely uh, covered uh, the two major figures in China at that time, one of whom I knew fairly well, one of whom I didn't. Um, there is a mistake being made now by this administration. Uh, people in this administration seem to believe uh, that uh, Xi Jinping is like the President of the United States and can free will. He can't. He's part of an institutionalized system. Uh, he is prima inter pares without any doubt. Uh, but he cannot make decisions on the fly. He needs to consult with colleagues. So I think we need to be more sensitive to the fact that not everyone's government is organized or disorganized the way ours is um, and uh, act accordingly. And I will end here because uh, I do need to, and you do, do need to do so for a variety of reasons. Well, so I want to uh, just, uh, keep my comments very, very short because we are over time. Uh, one of the things that I've observed um, in being in panels at conferences and elsewhere is that um, you can't really judge the success of a panel by the number of people attending. Uh, you judge it by the delta between the number of people at the beginning versus the number of people at the end. Uh, and we've, I think, done extremely well um, uh, tonight. And as I said, we are you know, beyond honored to have both of you here, uh, Ambassador Lord and Ambassador Freeman. And, uh, and Susan uh, simply uh, provides the third leg of the stool that, uh, you know, that really, I think, has informed all of us and has given us just a lot of food for thought um, in not only thinking about the past, but understanding about how it informs and, um, and, and uh, 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 helps us uh, manage and anticipate the future. So I want to thank all of you so very much for attending uh, and participating. I want to thank the audience for attending as well. And um, uh, I know that some of you have to go off to other things right now, so I will keep it brief and simply say thank you again and very much look forward to uh, keeping the lines of communication open. Thanks again. Thank you both. Wonderful. Thank you. And good night. Good night. Good night.